Welcome to this edition of The Technology Pill, a podcast that looks at how technology is reshaping our lives every day and explores the extraordinary powers of governments and companies. My name is Gus Hossein, and I'm the Executive Director of Privacy International. And today, I'm here again with my colleague, Caitlin, as we speak with the Eyes Tech Group. Hi, I'm Christopher Weatherhead. I am Lead Technologist at Privacy International. Hi, I'm Ed Garrity. I'm a Senior Technologist at Privacy International. Hi, everybody. I'm Elliot Bendinier, and I'm also one of the technologists at PI. They each bring different areas of expertise to PI, and they are all advanced users of various operating systems and contexts. So we're very fortunate to have them here today. In this edition, we're going to talk about spring cleaning. So periodically, we need to stop and look at our systems and our data to see what we've accumulated or hoarded, if you're me. Clean what's there, refresh, reset, and potentially delete some stuff. So while we're going to be asking our tech colleagues at PI what they do and what they think about these things, we're going to be saying a lot of things about various apps and operating systems and platforms, but it could never be comprehensive. This is just a podcast, after all, and it's time limited. We are going to mention some products, but just to be clear, these aren't endorsements by any means. Now, one of the basic tenets of PI, and I actually, uh, I think it was Ed who came up with it, but I've used it time and again ever since, is that security is hard. It's the fundamental approach that we take. Security is hard. Yes, it is also essential, but we always have to remember it's very hard to do this well. And it relies, in order to have a secure system or to secure your data, it relies on a complicated set of actions undertaken by many parties, whether it's you, the user, or intermediaries, or uh, platform owners, and others along the chain. So we get, as an organization and as individuals, asked all the time, like, what do you do to secure yourself? What apps do you use? But none of those will solve the problem. And we're always really nervous to be promoting specific approaches or specific platforms. Instead, our overall approach would be to maintain pressure and constantly keep an eye out and make sure that people are held accountable for conspiracies and cock-ups rather than relying on X app to never, ever make any mistakes. And just to be clear also, there's a limit to what you as the user can actually do. So much of the um, what's going on in your devices is actually hidden from you. It's hidden from you to control, it's hidden from you to ascertain, and it's hidden from you to do anything about it. The way we're going to try to do this is to actually give you some context. The solutions are never the same, depending if you're a protester, if you're living in country Y or country Z, or depending on what you're trying to achieve. And that's something we actually try and weave into all of the security work which we do. We do try and work on context as opposed to saying, just install this app and you'll be fine. I can't tell you what your reality is any more than uh, you can tell me what mine is, but I can at least give you some tools. So one of the narratives or one of the ways that we try and talk about security, which is happening on phones, when you're running, for instance, a lot of apps, it's not just about exfiltration of data and vulnerabilities and lack of updates, although these are problems. Fundamentally, this is draining your battery. If you've got 10 or 15 apps running at a time, that's going to be sucking the life out of your battery. And if you're on pay-as-you-go data or you've got a data cap, of course, it's burning its way through this data in a way that you don't even realize in the background, which could even be costing you money. So with all of that in mind, periodically, you need to go through all your devices and all your systems and all your accounts just to clean just to see what's there and determine what's not actually needed. Because data can so easily accumulate. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have the problem if you're someone like me and tend to break phones. If you haven't gone through every so often and and done a spring clean, you may actually end up losing all sorts of things, photographs or recordings or messages or whatever. So spring cleaning is not just about removing things and consolidating them, but it's taking stock of what you have and maybe working out you know, how to back your things up so you don't lose these photographs. We like the idea of a spring cleaning because it really gives you a moment to look and take stock, make changes. It's really the same thing as when you would do a spring cleaning in your house. Um, you don't have to go full Marie Kondo, but it's good to just sit down, take half an hour and think about how you're using your devices. 
Um, <laughs> Does Facebook bring you joy, Elliot? <laughs> exactly. That's this. That's the sort of question you should ask yourself. Well, every so often I do uninstall Twitter. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get to that actually. Uh, another reason to do this is that like things move fast. Like your favorite app or software might be abandoned, deprecated, or like they might have a vulnerability and you've never heard about it because you've just been using it on a daily basis. Or maybe it's been bought by a company that's just decided they're going to like exfil exfiltrate as much data as they can from this app. So taking this moment to like realize what you've been using and in again, in which context they operate is a good thing. But it's not even just what you're using. It's useful to go through and just look at what apps you aren't using. Um, it's way easier to uninstall apps which you don't use than it is to perhaps take stock and look into the permissions of the ones which you are using day to day. I used to do this on my commute into work as I would listen to music, uh, although obviously things have changed uh, recently um, and in the foreseeable future. But this is something which you can do just as you have five minutes, just scroll through your apps and see what you don't have and uninstall some things. Before anybody starts going around deleting things and cleaning things up, we've identified four things that people should do before they do anything else. And they are updates, have a password manager, see if your data has been breached, and do backups. Ed, talk us through updates. Absolutely. So there are two different strands to updates, really. There are updates for the apps which are running on your phones, which come individually through the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store or whatever other stores you have. And then you also have the operating system updates. So these are Android. So you have Androids usually around 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We even have 11 now. These updates are generally pushed out by either the phone manufacturer or more commonly pushed out by the phone network from whom you got your phone. This obviously does bring some problems with it in that if you have a lower cost device, or uh, as my colleagues have done some work on, or if you have an older device, then it's just not going to get updates for the core operating system, even if the apps are kept up to date. The core operating system itself may have vulnerabilities or, or indeed may be missing some great features. For instance, Android has come a long way in the last two or three years. The, the leaps between sort of Android's 6 and 7 to Android 10 in some of the controls and the privacy settings and analysis and, and indeed security that it gives you are practically incomparable. They're almost completely different operating systems in that sense. And the second thing we want to make sure you do before you undertake any spring cleaning, and I think this, I, I, I can't emphasize this one enough, it's to have a password manager, Elliot. The password manager is a boring topic. Like it's the one thing we keep bringing up, but we have to face the reality. You're probably using the same password in different places. You're probably using password that you've been using for the past 10 years. And this is just not secure. This is the keys to your digital life. And you, you can't keep doing this. You're basically putting your digital life in jeopardy. So password managers are the way to fix this. It's just one app, one master password to remember, and then you store everything in it. There are multiple options. We've used a few at PI. There's like KeePass, which is an open source solution, which will need to be associated with a cloud service if you want to be able to access it from different phones. But there are also like way easier solutions such as LastPass or 1Password or Bitwarden, which are all solutions that have a cloud option integrated so that you can have it on all of your devices. It's all synced all the time and you have access to all of your passwords. Usually all of these apps come with different compatibility with all of the OSs. So it doesn't matter if you have iOS or an Android phone or if you're using Windows or Mac OS, most of these softwares have cross-platform compatibility. So a boring topic, but really the one thing you should do if you want to keep your uh, digital life secure. To ask a question on that, though. Uh, so I set my mum up with a password manager um, while I was staying with her recently. And what she was using was she was you get the little prompts when you use browsers nowadays to see if you want to save your password in the browser. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know enough to tell her to get a specific password manager, but not enough to articulate why that doesn't seem like a good plan. Am I right to think that it's not? 
Yeah, it's it's a good question. I mean, it until very recently, all of the password managers that were integrated in Brother, were it, whether it is Chrome or Internet Explorer or Mozilla, they were just stored locally, which means that anyone with access to your computer could have access to it. You didn't even need a password. It was literally stored in clear in the device. So definitely a better option to use the dedicated software to handle your password. I will say, though, I think Mozilla recently moved to a secure hosting of password that is like linked to their cloud feature. They did. They rolled it out as part of uh, Quantum, I think, or it's fairly recent anyway, uh, which yep. is a cloud-based password manager, though I've not looked into it any further. But if it's out by Mozilla, yeah. they'll, have, they'll have paid some attention <laughs> to, to security and what have you, right? Hopefully. <laughs> You'd like to think so. That's like issue there, I guess, is that because the Firefox option is a free service, the amount of control you have is quite limited. You have slightly more control with iCloud as to where your iCloud account is being synced to. The one thing I do whenever I'm with, say, a family member or a friend who asks, you know, what's the most important thing I can do to secure my data and my devices, I, I tell them, Let's sit down for a few minutes and set up a password manager. It isn't as sexy as saying use Signal and use Tor, but it works, but it does take time and you have to upkeep it as well. So again, there are are four things we want to make sure that everybody does before you talk about doing any of the spring cleaning. Ed's already covered updates. We've talked about password managers. Next, you have to identify whether your data has been breached. Chris? So yeah, we hear about data breaches on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis these days, large companies getting breached. And often it's quite unclear what data has been breached because even the media reports are usually vague. They'll take the breach notification straight from the company's press release, which will often be like, no financial data was breached, but what other kind of data was breached? So we strongly would recommend you use a service, something like, have I been pawned? which is a free service where you can type in your email address and it will see where the email addresses are turned up in data breaches, which companies were breached and when. This goes back to password management in some respects because if a company has been breached, you can go back into your password manager, reset your password on their site, update your password manager, and it somewhat mitigates the data breach. Although data that's been stolen can't be got back, at least it stops your account being reused somewhere else. And last, the one that is hardest for people to remember, but it just is absolutely essential, backups. Yeah, so first you need to take stock of what you have and uh, work out what you need to back up. That does sound a little bit of a tautology stupid thing to say, but there's no point in backing up things which you have no need for in the future. Something which you downloaded on a one-off or something, a meme which a friend sent you perhaps, unless you want to keep them. Um, there's no point in, in just random backing ups. However, you may want to back up or you will want to back up things like your contacts lists. You'll probably want to back up things like the apps which you have installed so that if you lose your phone, you break your phone. If you're me or if your phone gets stolen or you you know anything that happens to it, you can very quickly just restore back what you had before. There are a few different ways of doing this. So many of the OSs, Android, um, iOS, have their own inbuilt backup systems. Uh, these will back them up uh, using either, in Android case, Google Play backup services, which has Google Photos, and they will back up all of your apps and your various app settings and it will back up, I believe, Wi-Fi passwords and things like that so that you can then, and it's, it's associated with your Gmail account, so that then if you log into another phone, you can restore all these settings and you're straight back on your Wi-Fi and it's reinstalled all your apps in the background while it's going. And iOS has a very similar thing, I believe, although I, I can't afford an iPhone. <laughs> of course, the problem with that is some people may be a little bit uncomfortable with using Uh, Google or uh, iCloud as your backup systems, that's okay to feel. But I would suggest it depends on what the risks are of uploading it. For instance, Google almost certainly already has all of these contacts that you're uploading anyway. That's a completely different argument for a completely different podcast. So are you really 
losing anything or, or putting yourself in a bit of jeopardy by perhaps backing it up, uh, as opposed to losing all of your contacts by dropping your phone in the bath. But also there are third-party backup solutions. There's uh, Microsoft's uh, OneDrive. There is Mega. There is, I don't know, Box. There are all sorts, many of which provide free storage space. Now, again, these are run by third parties, so you may want to be a bit cognizant or pay attention to what you're uploading and where. However, there are other solutions you can put on top so you can use encryption, for instance, so that you can, it doesn't matter what you're storing because the end service never sees anything in unencrypted form. It only ever sees encrypted. So you're decrypting on your personal device. So there are various apps which will do that, which are cross-platform, including NKFS is one of them. Although, you know, it's not, the security may not be world-class necessarily. It's, it's, it's almost certainly good enough for photographs and your contacts lists. And also it has other um, advantages because it's file system based. It means that you only have to move very small bits of data rather than a big chunk of encrypted things every time. I would just add that like you also can rely on the good old hardware backup. So if you have a, a an external drive that you can just plug into your computer or your phone and just copy paste of three photos. The rule here being the famous three, two, one, which is three different places, two different supports, and one, what is the one for? <laughs> I can't remember now. One off site, one offline. Oh yeah, one off site. <laughs> Stop those podcasts. Go make sure PI has all of those. <laughs> yeah, that's why they pay me the big bucks. <laughs> but actually, uh, just saying that, of course, Android, I know for a fact, and I'm pretty sure iOS will have as well. It certainly used to. You can back your phone up to a laptop or your, your desktop just by plugging it in the same way as you would if you charged. In the settings, there is actually a backup to desktop option. Uh, and that'll allow you to encrypt it and all sorts of things. But that again, that's for that's for kind of whole phone backups, which is the, the the wider ones as opposed to the targeted backups of these are the photographs I want. Sorry to get stuck on the topic of backups, but I think backups are also quite nuanced to how you use your devices and data. For example, my backups are majoritively settings because I'm often wiping devices and going through and resetting up how you like your ad block and how you like other such things is really time consuming. And so having a backup of just those things saves a ton of time. And then we were talking about whole phone and individual file backups. For example, my dad likes to keep his Windows PC on a rolling backup, and both Mac OS and Windows support a file restore feature where it keeps a constant rolling backup as you're creating data, which allows you to go back to a previous version of a file, which can be useful if your usage is heavily document centric and you're prone to occasionally overwriting a Word document or a PDF or something. It can be very useful to have something that allows you to go back to a previous version of that Word document external to Word's own internal restore feature. Yeah, it's very much related to your behavior, I guess. Cool. So we're going to start getting into hyper-specific, if you've got this phone, if you've got this phone stuff in a sec. But first, we wanted to have a fairly kind of higher level discussion of the broader things to consider. I think first we want to talk about kind of apps in general, what you should worry about, what you should not worry about. Chris? Okay. Yes, the problem of apps is that it's often very hard to see what kind of data they're sending and processing. So in the context of spring cleaning and looking through what apps you have installed, you have to consider that a lot of the apps might have, as, as PI has done research on previously, things like SDKs that send data back to Facebook or Google, or they have advertising in them, or they have other things that are sharing your personal activities within those apps back to other companies. Sometimes these services can work in the background, which is why we talk about removing apps you don't use, because not only does this improve the performance of the phone and offer 
more storage space for the apps and services you do use, but it also means that that data is no longer being sent in the background. So Chris, you're a Twitter user. Uh, I don't know if you use Facebook, but would you run on your, say on your mobile device, would you run the Twitter app or would you run the Twitter in a browser? On my device, I use Twitter in an app. That's probably a reasonable choice. I don't, I don't uh, like the thing. I guess the thing is almost a convenience. Okay. The, the reason I find that interesting is that first, Chris is the person at PI who analyzes apps and sees all the garbage and all the, the bad conduct. So based on all of Chris's hard work, I decided that I would actually run things in, in browsers because at least within a browser setting, you have a little bit more control about, well, to some degree, what uh, organizations get access to what data. Okay, so the final two issues before we get into the very, uh, very specifics. Virus and firewalls, do you guys use them? Yeah. Yes. On your personal <laughs> devices too, like your, on your mobile? No, ish. <laughs> I am a big advocate of firewalls. My personal setup at home, like a firewall is required because the way that, for example, like my ISP is BT, and the way BT now provides internet is they also provide an internet protocol version 6 address, which is the next generation of IP, which means that any computer is uniquely addressable anywhere on the planet. So having a firewall on pretty much every device is sort of mandatory. It's a bit of a problematic side to the technology and so obviously I have a firewall set on my MacBook. I have one set up on, I just use the integrated one that comes with I, um, Mac OS and the Windows firewall. As for 99% of use cases, it's probably fine. When it comes to virus scanning, I don't have a virus scanner on the MacBook. Not that MacBooks don't get viruses, just that my MacBook is primarily used in a very set way and like I only use it for PI work. I'm not downloading arbitrary things all the time. And if I do need to download a document or something that I'm feel, feels a bit sketchy, then I will run it in a VM on my work laptop. I won't need to virus scan it. On my desktop I rely on Windows Security Essentials, which is part of Windows 10. I don't know, again, I don't know how good it is as a virus scanner. It's kind of out of the way. It's probably better than nothing. It's actually supposed to be one of the better ones, I understand, which would make sense if you think about the install base because it's all reporting back centrally. So yeah. it's got, if it's got a massive install base, it's going to be better at protecting people in practice. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same as you. I don't have a MacBook. In fact, I'm the only one in the organization not to have a MacBook, which was my own choice. But on my laptop, I have a ThinkPad with, with Debian Linux, GNU, GNU Linux on it. So I don't use an antivirus on there. Again, not because Linux doesn't get viruses, because it does, but because I'm only really using it for very set things. So I use it for clerical work, typing, or I use it for... Um, writing code i don't i'm not using it to download and randomly run things which is effectively what you need it for on a desktop um yeah and antivirus again i use uh windows security essentials inbuilt into windows 10 it sits out the way fundamentally an antivirus is only ever going to get low-hanging fruit it's only going to get things which it, it it's already seen in the past that it knows about I remember when drive-by installs were a thing I mean, they aren't a thing anymore, <laughs> and that's because antiviruses just go, no, 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 I'm sorry, you're not allowed to just randomly install this because I visited your website. Again, on a, on a mobile phone, normally, you see, I would actually say there's, there's no need to run an antivirus on a mobile phone because of the way that the apps work, because they're all very atomic. However, uh, I will actually caveat that by saying that Many of the antiviruses um, through the work of some of our friends in this space now, so many of the antiviruses on mobile phones will detect abuseware, spouseware, whatever you want to call it, stalkerware, the, the, the vile software which turns, your, turns a mobile phone into uh, effectively a spy. There is actually something to be said for running an antivirus on your Android phone 
if you know that it's one that will pick up these potentially unwanted uh, softwares. And in terms of firewalls, yeah, I use the inbuilt ones. However, on my Android, I do have a firewall which allows me to switch off access to the internet for individual apps. So if I'm running a game, why does this, I don't know, tower defense app need to be able to get at the internet? Answer, it doesn't. But another thing that I can do with that, um, as well as being able to switch on and off individual apps, so I I run uh, an app called NetGuard, which is free as in Libra and free as in beer. Um, Although they they do ask for a, pro purchase if you can uh, i i probably will at some point um just because i use this software so much but it does allow you to um, do ad blocking on your mobile phone as well so it means that when you're browsing the web instead of having two-thirds of the page taken up with ridiculous adverts they're all gone there are no adverts in in game or in any of the apps i use i think the only thing i would add is that it it, it's really about your use and what you're doing on your machine and the more risk you take and the more what you're doing on your machine is dangerous. Like you're, if you're running random files you found in a random GitHub or a download page, or if you're from the 90s and you're executing an exit when you're trying to download a music file, these things are really going to do the job at the low level. So two of us in this conversation now have very young kids. I look forward to revisiting this conversation in about five years' time to see if we've done to change yep. our, uh, our security setups. You know, the thing is, like modern attacks come through ways which not necessarily even a good antivirus is actually going to stop, be it a spear phishing email or a social media link that does something malicious. It could even be JavaScript, which is actually more almost on the browser to defend you against rather than an antivirus, although an antivirus can often provide some additional protection. So there's actually it's where the attacks are coming from, which I guess is why, as we have said, the low-hanging fruit is what the antivirus primarily helps with. And there are other antiviruses that are free. Our family previously always used AVG everywhere. Um, AVG used to be very good. I don't really use it these days. I don't know whether it's changed much. Um, I used to be an advanced user. The problem I had with advanced was their advertising inside their antivirus was getting more and more prolific. It went from being a small thing at the bottom to being like a pop-up that appeared. I'm like, now you're actually appearing like for adware. I think they were found out to be siphoning users' data as well. Like if you were browsing the web, like the Avast antivirus was actually sending all of the URL you were visiting to a central server, which is yeah. insane. Oh, um, probably. I remember it had a man in the middle service for SSLs. It would do SSL stripping. That was a fast, wasn't it? Oh. Um, and one final point. Although we would strongly recommend you update your OS, if you're using something like Windows XP still, there are still antiviruses available for Windows XP. For example, ClamWin, which is a free antivirus. It's not fancy like some of the other antiviruses are. Like it won't provide a firewall or anything else like some of the other ones also do, but it will let you do file scans for malicious stuff. And it's getting, it continues to get up to date virus databases. This kind of segues us on a little bit to when is too old just too old? Unless you have a specific use case, and even then, I really doubt that most people who'd be listening to this would have. It's just dangerous to be running Windows XP these days. And, you know, mobile phones, you're you're reliant on someone else to be pushing the updates out. Now, Android or Google themselves have made massive strides uh, with their project Treble in Androids 8, 9, and 10, meaning that Android, Google themselves are able to push out updates from a central uh, position like Apple have always done. But fundamentally, if you're running a, a phone which just is running Android 6, Android 7, possibly even Android 8, it's probably time to get rid. I think you need to you need to replace it with something that's going to get updates. Going back to uh, work that I work on around low-cost tech, I guess part of the problem is that you can still go and, on Amazon right now and pick up a phone running Android 4.4 as new. 
Oh, absolutely. Um, I had to look for a, a phone recently, <laughs> um, although funnily enough, not for me. There are there are several phones out there. If you go for one of the major manufacturers, so Nokia or Motorola or Samsung, yeah, most of them will have a uh, budget with air quotes line. So these are mobile phones which are usually under two hundred US dollars. So, but they what you want to check is you want to check the support guarantees that they're going to have. There will be some level of uh, we will support this uh, for x versions or for instance the phone which i bought recently they said that uh, when i bought it it came out with android 9 and it said we will be providing updates to android 10 so i looked in advance so that it wouldn't just have one update and then the licensing runs out or you know there's no updates ever i guess the advice there is do your research the side problem of this is almost a lot of manufacturers especially in the lower price segment often release phones with the same name, which makes trying to work out whether it's the 2018 version, 2019 version, or 2020 version quite challenging. So we're going to move into the things that you can specifically start doing right now. Um, we're going to start with phones. Um, we're going to start with iOS, which is your Apple phone, your iPhone. Every user has their own approach to how they would do a spring cleaning. But for me, it is, of course, first delete the old apps. And because I, I do have a kid, you wouldn't believe the amount of apps I've downloaded just to, for those spare free <laughs> moments where it's like, okay, here's a screen. Please stop doing whatever you're doing. And uh, yeah, just going through and deleting all those. But and alongside that is... Um, the Apple interface isn't great, but it does have a, a privacy section in their operating system settings that allow you to identify which apps have access to what, like whether you're to your camera or your contacts, but also which apps are doing background processing to essentially decide, okay, well, this app doesn't need to be running in the background because that probably means it's getting my, well, location relevant data at any moment in time. And then there's a whole settings area for access to location and the fact that the operating system itself knows your location or your top locations, it's probably good practice to delete that periodically. But then we get into the awkward area when it comes to browsers. Uh, and that's the reason why I, I run multiple browsers on iOS, because if you use Safari and you want to control the cookies and occasionally like delete the cookies in the browser, the settings that they have there are really hard to decipher. And when you do hit like clean all cookies, it deletes all your open windows too. And the amount of times I've just I just like lost hundreds of browser tabs as a result, just because I want to clean out all the data that was being stored locally, which is why I now have multiple browsers, but each requires its own browser locking capability. But fortunately, iOS centralizes that again in the, in the OS, which has its disadvantages, I know but you can use the, these blockers and install them onto the device and whether it's better or the other blockers that are out there. It's, it's, it's hard to do this on iOS. So I actually find, oddly enough, the, the, the healthiest thing to do is just occasionally, and I do this around spring clean, I just delete the, the device. Like I reset the device after I've done all the stuff that we've talked about, which is you back it up and you have your password managers and all of that, but just delete, clean, and reinstall. Chris, you're an iOS user. What do you do? So I'm I'm with you on most of those things. One thing I would also add is if you're if you ever work for a company that has a bring your own device policy, and they install their management software, you can go through to profiles under general settings and delete the profiles if you're no longer at that company, or even if they update it occasionally, you might find that you have like old versions of VPNs or old versions of some internal line of business software that's being managed remotely that you can un uninstall or remove. Most of what you say is exactly the same for me. I had a couple of issues on my old iPhone 7, which, could, which only seemed to resolve after I wiped it. If I enabled tethering, I would lose 4G, but as soon as I wiped it, that resolved itself. And because of the period we're in with COVID-19, spending so much more time doing voice chat, I was finding that doing video chat was 
absolutely hammering my battery life. And again, resetting the device resolved that as well. So I guess things just build up over time and having a having a, the ability to wipe the device fully does offer you like a clean start. And the Apple way of doing this is quite easy to do because you can back up the entire operating system to iCloud um, without having to do anything particularly fancy. One aside of this I had was restoring. I actually had quite a lot of problems restoring. A number of times I had to go through the whole setup, including setting up Siri, and then it would just be like, I can't restore anymore, <laughs> which is quite frustrating. But it did eventually restore. So I don't know if that was a, a localized issue, whether that was something to watch out for. There's very little control in iOS, as far as I know, for resetting things like your advertising ID. You can obviously set in the settings, as you say, in the privacy settings, you can turn off personalized advertising, which makes it harder for advertisers to track you uniquely. iOS itself has improved in a lot of other ways in the background to protect your privacy better, such as rotating Bluetooth uh, Mac addresses for beacons, for example, something which we've covered recently in relation to COVID trackers. Don't get me started on COVID trackers. It's too early for me to start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> How about Android? Pretty similar, although um, actually Android, as of version 9, gives you, or 8 maybe, gives you a lot more access to atomic permissions. So you can see, for instance, what has access to my location data, what has access to my microphone, what has access to storage and the camera. Yeah. So it's worth on, on Android as well, just going through, there is a privacy section. And again, it depends on which version of Android you're running, unfortunately. But there will be in there a Google section, which will be uh, Google location history. There's advertising ID, as you can do, as Chris just said, regenerate an ID and say, don't use a, a personalized ID. I don't want to see personalized advertising. You can switch off diagnostics or switch on diagnostics. I'd suggest switching it off, but, you know, that's just me. So the problem, the problem we've got, of course, is that Android is so broken as an ecosystem. You can back up your entire phone to your desktop, or you can back it up to Google uh, using the inbuilt um, uh, Gmail stuff. However, for spring cleaning, this is not necessarily as good as it is for uh, phone restoration. So if you were to do a, a backup and then wipe your phone and then re-import this backup, unfortunately, all of the crud that you've just spring cleaned by removing would come back with it um, because it is actually a full backup so that is great for for uh, phone restoration but not so good for spring clean so what i suggest you do is you can i believe you can choose whether or not to back up the actual data or whether just to back up the apps themselves i'd suggest that you just back up the apps and uh, you go through and delete things that you don't want it to back up anyway and then do a system reset. For me, like the real spring cleaning is always looking at the apps that I have, like um, making sure that everything I have installed, I still use and uh, or I will use in the future and removing everything else and then going through permission. Because uh, every so often I find myself like, I don't know, I'm, I'm running in the street to catch a bus or whatever. And like this app is asking me, can he have access to my location? I say yes. And I forget about it. And six months later, I do my spring cleaning. I'm like, why was this thing accessing my location for this whole time? So that, that's why it's good to just sit down and go every one of the things that you have installed. Make sure that the settings are the way you want it to be. One final point around both iOS and Android is it might also be wise to have a look at the actual data you have on your device. You know, go through your pictures, especially if you're backing these up to a cloud service. You might just want to go through your pictures, and if there's anything in your pictures which was like a drunk night out or your your uh, sexting exploits, you might want to go through and delete those if you don't want to keep them in case they ever did get breached in some way. Preferably don't store them in the first place. And the same goes for messages. I know that we personally quite like Signal and Wire and other services that allow automatically deleting messages, but services like WhatsApp and 
the inbuilt SMS app, so most of the phones don't automatically delete messages. It might be wise to look back through some of your old correspondence, especially if it's correspondence with something like tradesmen. I, I find this a lot on phones. So I have a text conversation with a tradesman. I don't know why I still keep it on the phone. You know, it's a good time to go through and delete those because unless you're expecting, like if you keep the contact details, you don't need to remember that you got them to fix a door or a pipe necessarily 12 months ago. You can get rid of the conversation. Cool. So we're going to talk a bit about services. In a lot of these cases, one great option is like delete your account, just get off the platform like Facebook. It's the advice you'll hear a lot, particularly old accounts that you're not using. That's really good advice. But like me and my friend who loves to send me pancake party invites on Facebook, there might be good reasons that you want to keep certain accounts. So we're going to go through those services and the things that you can do if you do want to keep it. So we're going to start with social media and Facebook and Instagram. Elliot? Yeah, so I'm not a big user of Facebook, as I said, neither of Instagram, but um, I, I still keep my account. And so every once in a while, I just go through all of the settings, basically, because I know Facebook has this bad habits of adding a new feature to control your privacy, which is, oh, nice, it's a good move. Thank you, Facebook. But uh, enabling by default the less private uh, setting. So um, usually... Once in a while, I will just go through the settings, look at everything that is related to first the privacy of the account. So who can see uh, my profile, who can find me, what type of data other people I have access to. And then I go through the ad settings usually because I don't want any targeted ads. I don't want my profile to be shared at least as much as possible within the settings offered by Facebook and Instagram, obviously. Um, because their business model is still to do advertising. So you can only do so much if you keep your account. I'll tell you what as well, um, that's great advice if you want to avoid buying things, because the Instagram algorithm in terms of advertising things to me has gotten scarily good, and I like keeping some money. So if you want to cut down on your outgoing spending, this can also help you out. Uh, yeah, so uninstall Steam. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to expand on what Elliot has just said as well, around Facebook and Instagram and many of the other online services, one of the things you can also do, go into the settings, and there's often an option to log out all other accounts, so anywhere else you're logged in. Often you can have a long list of places you've logged in, especially if you're logging in on different browsers and things. You end up with a whole backlog of different Facebook account logins. And it's quite useful just to log them all out. And while you're there on that page, I believe it's the same page, it's also an opportunity to set up two-factor authentication. If you're using a password manager, most of the password managers can actually manage a two-factor, second-factor authentication. And it makes your account so much more secure than just a password alone can in a lot of cases. Yeah, the final thing, I guess, with Facebook is... It's really up to you, but like you could use the Facebook's Onion service. They have a Tor hidden service, which does offer, I guess, a little bit of extra privacy protection, particularly from where you're logging in, so they don't know where you're coming from. It might be an idea as part of your regime to think about setting that up. Uh, also, while you're in Facebook, look through what apps you've authorized. So if you're using Facebook app on your phone, that will be authorized and it, it should list it. And also what games and things like Farmville, if you've allowed Farmville at your profile, because there may well be um, games that you haven't played in a while that are still sat there just slurping bits of data every so often. This is one of those moments for a public service announcement, though, like the number of times I've gone through and asked why does this app have uh, give permission to that device and it, i doesn't need that anymore so i kill it and you can almost hear the screaming somewhere else in the household when they realize they've, they've lost access to an account so it's uh, <laughs> uh, well, that's, yeah that's a real problem with uh, single sign-on so whenever you use your facebook account or your google account uh to sign into another service like you're usually giving access to way more than just like oh the ability to sign up on a site using my account on facebook so that's a really good piece of advice the extent of that is also like you'll often find that 
some of the companies that will if you you have logged in with Facebook or you've logged in with Gmail or you've logged in with whatever, you occasionally find that some of those companies have either been gone defunct or have been bought by someone else. <laughs> or in the case of Zynga, have been uh, hacked and had everything dumped online after they've gone and bought everyone else. Yeah. And so, <laughs> again, like, for example, I used to use Clout, which was a service for basically monitoring your social presence. I'm pretty sure that's now defunct. Um, and so it's a good opportunity to remove their access as they no longer need it if they don't exist anymore. Is there anything similar to say about Twitter, Ed or Gus? I actually followed Ed's advice on Twitter, which was to delete my tweets. Do you still do that? I haven't in a while. Part of the reason is because it used to be a lot easier to be able to write apps that you could just plug into Twitter, but they're, they're making it a lot more difficult to run bots and things now. I did it relatively recently, about six months ago. I, I deleted my Twitter history, and so it only kept like the last 300 tweets and it just felt like a, it just felt good. You know, you can become a little obsessed with yourself and say, oh, but I've lost that one tweet that somebody, that a bunch of people finally liked or read three years ago. But equally, like now that your social media profile is being used to make decisions about you, and like the US government's asking for your, your handles at the border, it's nice to be able just to say, well, I don't have anything to worry about there anymore. Absolutely. And we've seen with some of the investigations which uh, our colleagues have been running, we've seen that local authorities, the councils in the UK have been using social media to check out benefits claimants. So, you know, why should the fact that I may have gone on a holiday six months before I go on, if I, if I was to claim benefits, why should that be held anyway against me? A lot changes in six months, right? So I used to, I used to have it auto-deleting. There are still some services out there. I believe uh, Michael Lee released one recently, but again, similar to one that I wrote, uh, you have to host it yourself, which is a bit of a pain. But I think there are, is it TweetDeck, does it? Uh, one, there is one of the big Twitter clients actually allows kind of auto-expiring messages. Excellent. A new way I can hide my secret One Direction loving past. <laughs> <laughs> I don't share this with uh, Caitlin or anybody else before we find out about her. <laughs> 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 It's not that secret. I've been inflicting One Direction on the office for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, and while while you're there, it is uh, it is worth um, setting up two factor authentication. Twitter now allows you to do it through an app as well, so you can do it through your password manager, uh, or you can do it through SMS, getting a text message sent to your mobile if you prefer. And also uh, look through authorized accounts. Again, open sessions, which applications are allowed to post, which applications are allowed to read, what they're allowed to do. It's worth just going through every so often and just uh, revoke apps that maybe are installed on an old phone you don't have anymore or something like that. Twitter especially, but also on Facebook. It's also quite fun to go through what your advertising profile is because they're quite detailed. And it's, it's quite great nonsense. It's quite it's quite interesting to find out what uh, their machine learning or whatever it is they're using has discerned about the tweets you send and the people you follow. You can't really delete very much of that, I don't believe, on Twitter, but it is quite interesting. You can you can tell them I'm not interested in this and they go, Oh, okay, we'll refine our algorithm. But my one seems to think that uh, I'm some elderly lady who's very, very religious which is quite interesting because I don't think I've ever posted. I don't think I've ever tweeted about religion, ever. Um, <laughs> but you have tweeted about being an elderly lady. Have I? Probably. <laughs> Apple News, uh, which I use, gets confused because it keeps on wanting to assign a gender to me when it comes to, to um, exercise news. And it, it, it varies in age, depending, like it takes me down these, these alleyways that, okay, then you must be as, just like your colleague, Ed, you must be like seven year, years old uh, and uh, interested only in slow moving yoga to, oh, you're like a 20 something year old and you jog all the time. And it's good. Uh, and there, there are times you just don't want to lose that identity. <laughs> you don't want to be pushed into the worst. Apple News is the worst. <laughs> no, you think that's the worst? Amazon. I see that you looked at three vacuum cleaners and you bought one. Here's a hundred different vacuum cleaners. You must be collector. Only <laughs> <laughs> later for crying out loud. And if I could delete those profiles, I would be very, very happy. 
there's an opportunity then to go through when you're getting those kind of emails to unsubscribe, especially some of those marketing ones are very unsubscribable from. You can actually suppress quite a lot of what Facebook, Amazon, LinkedIn, a load of them send lots of what are essentially spam emails to try and get you to re-engage on their platforms and you can unsubscribe from them. I'm a big fan of that, like the cleaning box and just for trying, basically cleaning box is just trying to have your mailbox empty, which I never managed, let's be honest, but I delete as much as I can. When something comes in, it's like delete, remove. And whenever this is a uh, communication email, it's I immediately go to the unsubscribe if I don't find it useful and I try to remove as much as possible. It's also a good way to keep track of different accounts you might have on different services. Um, you receive this one email because they implemented the GDPR or something or because COVID-19 and you're like, why the hell do you still have my email address? Well, monitoring your inbox and making sure you don't miss that type of stuff is just a good practice. And uh, yeah, you can do this as part of your spring cleaning, go through your 300 emails and uh, try to clean it. And also like the unsubscribe thing, that might sound like a lame argument, but you're doing something for the environment because every email that is being sent is consuming electricity in a way. So if you're unsubscribing from like 20 newsletter that are sending you three emails a week, like you're actually saving a bit of energy doing that. One small proviso, you do have to be a little bit careful because some kinds of spam will give you an email that is junk or is malicious in some way mm -hmm. and it will still include an unsubscribe link and by clicking that unsubscribe link you're basically informing them that this email address works okay so in the final section we're going to look at operating systems for desktop computers and we have windows mac os and of course the linux unix world so i'm a windows user in my personal life and if i'm doing a spring clean which i'll be honest isn't that often i'm not a very good cleaner but the the tools that i like generally go through would be like go and look at the disk cleaner there's a under accessories in all Windows versions, I believe, there's a disk cleaning utility that will allow you to clean up what are essentially Windows files. So the way Windows 10 and other recent versions of Windows updates, so when they do a full feature update, they take a copy of the old version of Windows. It will get rid of those old backups. Um, it will also do some basic cleaning of things like temporary files, arbitrary data like cookies for Internet Explorer and Edge. And so it's like a very, just a handy tool to just run. For my hard disks, I then generally do a defrag, which is basically the way hard disks work is that they're physical spinning disks and it's quicker to access data at certain points on the disk. And over time, as you add and delete files, they get moved around the disk and they're not always in the most logical place. Uh, defrag basically realigns all the data to be more logically laid out and therefore increase disk performance and disk access time. It only really applies to physically spinning disk. If you have an SSD or any kind of flash storage, in fact, it actively discourages not to defrag it because it just adds wear to the drive. There's a program called CC Cleaner, which stands for Crack Cleaner, basically. And it's a bit like the internal disk cleaner that comes with Windows, except it does third-party applications as well. It'll clean up cookies and cache data for Chrome and Firefox and umpteen other applications. And it will also do deep cleaning of certain bits of Windows, getting rid of redundant shortcuts. I'd strongly advise you're careful with it because it can be quite aggressive with the way it cleans. But it, if you go through and you're sensible with it, it can be very useful for uh, getting rid of a lot of deeply ingrained stuff that you very hard to find often. CC Cleaner also actually has an uninstall function. It's exactly the same functionality that allows you to remove old programs. Most of the recent versions of Windows have a column in their install lists of when the program was installed or when it was last used. So you can sort by last used and if you haven't used the app for like two years or three years or whatever, 
it might be worth just uninstalling it. Um, again, slight bit of a revised one that often some of the apps you install will come with device drivers. Just watch out for those. They're made for a specific bit of hardware you have. Sticking on the topic of device drivers, if you do see that you have a device driver that hasn't been updated for a long time, it might be worth going and seeing if there's an update for it. And then you've got your own system data, images or documents or programs or zips or whatever. Uh, I like to use a program which is free called WinDiastat. It will make like a visual map of what your disk looks like. And obviously big squares in the map are files that are taking up a lot of space. And you might want to see whether those could be removed. Again, provide on that. It will also show you big Windows files, like they can be minimized and maybe can't be removed. But if you if you see that you've got like a movie and you've seen the movie and you no longer care about the movie, you might want to delete the movie. It's pretty comprehensive and it allows us to cover Mac OS relatively quickly because a lot of that functionality and a lot of those issues exist there. And I'd pick up on the wiping issue. At PI, we wipe our devices periodically much to the consternation of our colleagues who you can occasionally hear the scream of like, oh my God, I just lost X, Y, and Z. So wiping is dangerous, but I have to say that um, having a clean device without anything on it except for what you want for how you're using your device now, it just feels so good. And then setting up a new device or just going to your current device, just making sure that you're not using your admin account by default as your user account. Do you want to explain a bit why it's better to use a user account? Do you want to go for that? Sure. So on Mac OS particularly, if you're logged in as an admin, you can install software without the additional authentication. Whereas if you're in as a user account, you have to type in your username and password every time you want to install software. Now, this is kind of annoying when you're in the middle of installing software you know you're installing. But it's really handy when things are updating in the background or software installs in the background. And it gives you a, like a very clear prompt that something is being installed and it gives you the opportunity to cancel it. Whereas if you're logged in as an admin, it will just go ahead and install it without any confirmation. And so while you're doing all that, uh, make sure you, your file vault is turned on so all the data is encrypted um, on your device. Make sure the firewall is turned on and check some of the rules that might be there that might have been there uh, that you might have changed at some point in the past, but you no longer need them to be watered down. Some people like myself, I include, I run a, a separate firewall on top of that, like little snitch. You could also install and, and verify that you have installed content blockers just in the same way you would do on iOS so that you can block ads. I, I guess it's the same as in Windows. You would go into the security and privacy settings of these operating systems now and just look at, again, what apps are accessing what permissions. And these are relatively recent developments in all the operating systems, and it's welcome to be able to have that central point to review what's going on and, and to to basically delete access to parts of your operating system that's just not needed anymore. Ed, how about the, uh, the world of operating systems you inhabit? So I think the easiest way on Linux is to start from how it's partitioned. So when you go to go and install, you're given uh, generally, depending on which one you're installing, you're given one of two choices. Either you can have it partitioned so that all of your user files, which is your home directory, like my documents in the Windows world, all of your files sit in one logical disk, and then everything else sits in other logical disks. This was a decision taken back in the 70s, so that you can move between various different operating systems whilst keeping your data in one place. Of course, that is a bit of a problem if you haven't actually partitioned in that way. So many operating systems or many Linux distributions now uh, may just ask to uh, install just to the whole disk in the same way as Windows or Mac OS does, where it just uses the whole disk and there's no logical separation between user data, operating system data, and etc. Fundamentally, because it's designed to keep user data in one place, in the file system, you generally don't tend to get much 
craft kind of build up because it's all very obvious. But where you do tend to see them is in hidden folders, which are user settings generally for a piece of software which you've installed. So if you run, for instance, Wine, which is a compatibility layer between the Linux kernel, the thing which sits between your hardware and the software and Windows software, so that you can run Windows software, all of those settings are held in your user home directory. So it's worth having a little look. They're called uh, dot .folders or dot .files, the directories that are hidden. If I may add, these are probably the ones that you want to back up if you don't want to have to go through the hassle of resetting all of your programs after reinstalling your OS. So the dot .files being backed up somewhere allows you to just keep your configuration and makes your next install way faster. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's your, your profiles, for instance, your web browser profiles are all stored in your home folder. So you do want to be a little bit careful about what you go and just kind of delete. I also run um, a firewall on my Linux machines, depending on which one you're running, there are which which of the distributions you're running or whether you're running a, a BSD or whatever there there are hundreds of different <laughs> choices of firewalls um, I would suggest probably most people are going to be on a Debian or Debian derivative like Ubuntu but then there are other fedoras and things but there's uh, uncomplicated firewall UFW it's called or uh, which I believe is Ubuntu only or there is um, firewall D which is fedora's version Debian comes by default with IP tables. Most of these have a GUI front end so that you can set them as a user because, of course, it's the year of Linux on the desktop. Uh, so we will all be using it <laughs> come the end of 2020. Linux, the kernel also provides um, encryption called Lux encryption. Oh, that allows you to do a whole disk at rest encryption. So it's very similar to File Vault on, on Mac OS or on the Microsoft One, whose name completely escapes you right now. The thing about encryption is actually you're right. It's something you can do across all of the operating systems we've talked about. For Windows, the integrated BitLocker, it's good for day-to-day -day usage. Like if you're not trying to stop the NSA getting into your machine, it's probably more than adequate for your needs. Um, if you want something a little more robust, you're on your own in some respects, but something like Veracrypt, which works on both Mac, Windows, and Linux. Yeah, I would, I would add to that that I think BitLocker is a Windows Pro feature only. So chances are if you've bought your uh, laptop in a mall or like any commercial public store, you won't have this feature, in which case you'll have to use a third-party service. And then on... Mac, it's File Vault, and File Vault can be done either on a disk or on particular files, I believe. You can have either containers or, or the whole disk can be encrypted. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it was long, but hopefully it was relevant and useful. We'll put as many of the links as we can remember or find in the show notes on the main page of the podcast on our website or variously underneath wherever you're listening to this. We appreciate that not everywhere will let you directly click on the links. So it might be best to, once you're finished listening, come find us at privacyinternational.org and search for the podcast. And you should be able to see this episode with a, what can only probably be described as an overwhelming repository of links. The world moves fairly quickly. We won't be updating those pages. So if you're listening to this in a year's time, it may be better to disregard those links and Google them for yourself. You can sign up to be the first to hear about when we do release any more guides or indeed everything else that we're doing at action.privacyinternational.org. You can like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're currently listening to it. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, YouTube and Facebook, variously at Privacy International or at Privacy Int on Twitter because Twitter is annoying. Thank you very much for listening. Music courtesy of Sepia. Podcast produced by Max Bennell for Privacy International. <laughs>